I love DJing. I love being part of events, being part of people's celebrations. So the business end of things, even to today, is still an evolution. This is Wedding DJ School. I'm Josh Mitchell, your guide to the business of a wedding DJ. We're talking with leaders in the wedding entertainment industry. You're going to learn their backstories, how they got started, and where they are today. We're talking with Justin Reed, owner of Uptown Entertainment in Greenville, South Carolina. Uptown Entertainment really goes above and beyond to serve their guests with excellence. They deliver an elevated entertainment experience for modern weddings and events. On the video version of this podcast, you'll see footage of their spectacular enhancements. They provide deluxe DJ booths, indoor spark fountains, snow machines, club cannons, dancing on clouds, social media ready photo booths, and so much more. And Justin and his team, they didn't start off with all of this. So today you will hear Justin's backstory and some of his key learnings after being in the industry for about 16 years. He has a degree in graphic arts from the University of South Carolina Carolina upstate and has an eye for design. He also has a great sense of marketing. And as you'll hear in today's episode, a business mindset to make sure that everything is moving in the right direction financially. Today, you're going to learn how Justin transitioned from the club scene to high-end weddings, how he went from charging as low as $585 for a wedding to multiple times that. So you're going to hear about the importance of value for DJs, and Justin is really just a great teacher and somebody to learn from. So we're going to hear his backstory today. So here he is. Here is Justin Reed. Yeah, so I'm Justin Reed. I own Uptown Entertainment here in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, Gosh, I've been doing this for starting to feel old. Um, I've been doing this for 16 years now, and really over the last... Um, since about 2012, really, really focused into weddings and um, and then just really kind of honed in on what we want to provide and the experiences we are looking to create. And um, we've had a good time doing it thus far. So it's, 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 it's been a fun ride so far. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. For anybody who's watching right now on the YouTube version of the podcast, we're going to post some clips to kind of visualize a little bit about uh, Justin's company. But tell me uh, kind of what you guys do that's unique. Yeah, so average, we don't do average. Um, We want to really create an experience that isn't every day. You know, there's a lot of DJs out there. I was one of them at one point who every weekend I went out and did kind of the same thing. And um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but where we are and being creative, we wanted to really kind of take that to the next level and elevate the events um, and the work that we were doing. So incorporating technology into that, uh, everything from club cannons to moving heads to spark fountains, all of those kinds of things, um, and really bringing that around talented DJs. Um, All of our DJs beat mix, we are, most of us come from a club background, so we're not playing the original song, we're not playing all four minutes of the song. Um, It is more of a club experience, and that's really what we've become known for. And that's where we are mostly referral based as far as how people find us. And it's really that that's kind of been the differentiator. Awesome. So I want to take a moment and kind of step back to the beginning, kind of go back to to the early days. I kind of want to hear your origin story of where did you start? Like, tell me a little bit more about yourself and, and those early days back when you decided to first get into DJing and everything. All right. So I actually, back in 2003, um, came to work for Uptown Entertainment. It was just random, uh, universe aligned. I met the owner of the company at the time. Um, a few years after that, I was DJing weddings, running some of the office, and then he decided to sell the business. So 2007, I bought the business um, in my early 20s, early to mid 20s. And as a single dude, I thought it would be far more uh, fun to go into bars and nightclubs and do trivia and karaoke and all of this stuff um, with my infinite wisdom and uh, drove it straight into the ground. And um, so we did that as far as the private event side. That was non-existent. 
so we were more in the bar and nightlife side and um, certainly learned a lot of stuff there. But uh, back in, I think it was late 2011, had the opportunity, oddly enough, the former owner of the company was asked to DJ a wedding. He goes, I just want to MC. And I was like, I'll DJ, fine. And um, it wasn't so bad. In fact, it was a really fun time. I was like, all right, are these weddings? I'd come to hate them. I don't know why. Um, I think it was just there were things on at that time in my life that were more fun. Um, and I wasn't thinking business mind. I was just thinking fun time. So DJ to wedding, ironically, around the time I met my wife. So I'm like, wait a minute, all this aligns. Let's get out of the clubs. So focus back into weddings, um, really 2012-ish time frame. And then over the last few years, really, um, we've had growth year over year. And then just the um, evolution of, of our services and offerings has gone along with that. So it's been a fun like seven years. And um, even in the seven years, weddings have changed a ton um, from when we started at that basic like $685 price point um, to getting, you know, mul multiple times that uh, for weddings. And weddings are most of what we do currently with Uptown. You mentioned that at one point you kind of drove the business into the ground. And then you also mentioned you, you didn't kind of have that business mindset. Tell me a little bit more about that, of what you learned in terms of uh, kind of having that business mindset on. So for me and from when I, I talked to a lot of other DJs, and so my story isn't unique in this fact. I got into this because I loved what I did. I love DJing. I love being part of events, being part of people's celebrations. So the business end of things, even to today, is still an evolution. I learn something every day, you know, right now, um, just, you know, bringing on a bookkeeper for the first time, stuff like that. So, and learning more about where our money goes and all of that. So it's a constant evolution. I'm not the greatest business person ever um, when it comes to that end of things. So having, finding a mentor or mentors um, in this business is guys who have done it longer, who are, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. So find somebody that's good at the things you're not. Um, and then you, you generally can help each other out to mutually beneficial things. So, um, yeah, man, I mean, I drove straight into the ground, righted it, uh, in that time, in the difference of the time from, gosh, I don't know, 2009 ish to 2012 technology, like wedding based promotion websites and things like that came along. Um, so when I hopped back in, it was a different ball game. Um, so we kind of pivoted marketing strategies and that is kind of my bread and butter. So, um, so I hop right in with more internet marketing. Um, and then, you know, here we are today. Yeah. I think that's so important to have that, uh, mindset of business. And as you said, to find a mentor, somebody who's farther along than you and who knows kind of what they're talking about, because at first, and, and I think we're all guilty of this, you get into the craft because you enjoy it. There's an element of, um, of enjoyment in, in doing the work. And, um, and then you realize at some point I can make money at this. So when you, when you look back on those early days, when you first started making money as a DJ, what lessons did you learn? Or, you know, tell me about that when, when you first started making the money, what was going through your mind? Um, well, <laughs> like most undisciplined, uh, you know, a lot of DJs I, I talk to, I find a lot of similarity in some part of our lives. And, um, you know, it was, I was just a bar or club DJ, no discipline. I wanted to roll into, you know, this is me pulling the curtain back, I guess a little bit, but that was me just, I got to make money and go DJ music for four hours, stay out late, talk to chicks, the whole deal. Like that was the appeal, um, with no discipline. My, my one, um, I guess advice that I would provide from going down that road and making plenty of mistakes on the way is, is save, save something. Um, you know, it was oh, a lot of bar and nightclub DJs get paid cash. That's great. Um, but it was easy in, easy out. So from personal experience, it would be save some of that, you know, it's just, 
if I had have saved 10% of what I made then, I'd be a lot better off now. So it's just one of those things um, to keep in mind. I don't know if that really answers your question, but when it comes to mind, as far as looking back at those days for me, um, just the the savings and, and looking at from a business mind. There's some younger guys in this industry that I look at who are super successful right now. And, um, and I'll give the guy a shout out. So like Josh Daly and I, uh, he's out of Columbus, Ohio. He's super successful. And this dude is probably seven or eight years younger than me. Um, and he, so he got the jump start. I was focused on other things. He had his eye on the ball. Just a great example of bringing on people that, and looking at it in a mindset that's business focused, not, um, just selfish or, or just there for fun. It is a fun job, you know, um, do what you love, love what you do. That is my mantra. That is why we do what we do. My goal is to have many, you know, over time have several full-time folks on. Um, because saying I DJ full-time, make an awesome living care, you know, be able to care for my family, um, and save for future and all of that. Like that's really important to me. So, um, so yeah, that's, don't be stupid like me. Save, save a little money if you're younger and doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think that's a huge takeaway for, for people to consider where, wherever they are in their journey is that you have to have some left over after, um, you've gotten paid and, and you've got to value yourself and you be, be charging enough that there is uh, enough money to, uh, to kind of, uh, save something at the end of the day so that you can turn it into a sustainable business and not just something where, you know, the money's coming in, as you say, and the money's going right back out because it, uh, at that point, it's just kind of a hobby. You're just kind of making the money and it's kind of going back out and it's not really a business. Tell me a little bit more about like what other business lessons or, or, specifically as it relates to how, how have you, uh, in, in other words, your company now, just if, if I were first starting off and I saw a website like yours and all the incredible stuff that you offer, um, that didn't happen overnight. So, so tell me, what, what was that like in terms of what needed to happen in the business to, to get you where you are today? Did you just buy all that stuff one day, one day overnight and just pay it off? doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. One of the things I would... I, I'll come to this. One thing I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something talking about money and saving, what you were talking about, um, and structure. That's something I lacked in my financial end is structure. Um, I've heard of a system called Profit First. It's a, a book by Mike Michalowicz, audio book. On, it's super cheap, and it just basically helps you manage your money. If anybody listening to this, it, do yourself a favor. Read that, especially with business. Super helpful. All right. So to your thing, how did we get here today? Um, well, I don't love buying on credit. So it is not a it, – sometimes it's necessary. Yes, I know. But most things, if it's worth having, it's worth saving for. And so for us, it's just been an evolution. You know, we started off 2012 with, you know, which – for me kind of getting steering into DJing back into private events, like powered speakers are now a thing and all this jazz. Um, you know, we did not start with line array <laughs> back then we had basic powered speakers. And then over time, as your quality improves, as your price point improves, which and value improves, um, as do the other parts that surround those equipment. Um, we all love buying gear. I know that, but, you know, truly um, having reliable quality equipment on hand um, and backups and all of that super huge. So, so from getting back in, yeah, I mean, it was super basic. I look back at those now and of course, like we look back at our old stuff and it's just like, ah, a little cringeworthy. Um, same. Uh, but over time, you know, we've, there's a little bit of luck involved and a lot of bit of research involved. So kind of seeing what people in, I'm in South Carolina, we're slow to everything. So what are the major markets that the trends trickle down to us doing? Um, so not everybody has that luxury, but there are certainly ways of researching and, and finding out what the next big thing is or um, what it could be. And just being creative, collaborating with other people. Um, I'm huge with talking to other people about what's working for them. So, um, 
like I said, a little bit of luck every once in a while. We'll just kind of take a flyer on something and hope for us, like, here, not that this is a huge thing, but, like, the club cannon found an opportunity that would kind of pay for it and said, what the heck, we'll give it a shot. And as far as add-ons, you know, uplighting given, but that's one of the things that I'll sit down with a bride and she'll say, are you bringing that thing to my wedding? So it's little stuff like that. So be smart. Don't, you know, buy within your means. Um, like I said, I don't try to go in crazy debt for anything. Um, that I couldn't pay back in a short amount of time. Um, finding things that are a good return on investment. Um, there's a few things right now I want. I just don't think they'd be a good return on investment. So we're going to holding pattern uh, for a while until we figure out if there's actually a market there for it. So, um, yeah, no, it's not a – I saw somebody online the other day. I can talk about this forever. So I saw somebody online the other day talk about um, – would you rather have a couple premium dates booked in a month or have packed weekends with more, you know, me, me, lower to medium weddings? And my personal thought on that is first, how long have you been doing this? They said we're new. This is not me trying to be hateful, but you cannot be new and premium all at the same time. It just doesn't work like that. We all, you do have to pay your dues. You do learn as time goes on. So now having DJed for what, like 16 years, um, I'm a lot better now than I was last year and the year before and the year before. So always be learning, always a student. I'm always a student. So um, that's why I think your podcast is still relevant for anybody. There's never a point at which you've arrived. So, you know, that patience is a thing. Put in your time. Um, you cannot just instantly start, you know, there's, there's minor league baseball for a reason. They don't start in the major leagues. They've played for 15 years of their life before they get there. It's the same is true for this. So um, honing your skills and um, really, I guess, patience and um, always having that desire to improve um, and learn is, is huge. Another thing that's propelled, us is about four years ago, I attended a DJ conference for the first time, um, armed DJs in Tennessee. So smaller, regional, the beauty of those smaller regionals is you, the dude who's on stage, that person who's on stage, you get to have a drink with that night, or you can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. It's not like some of the bigger shows, which are still great, but you don't have that ability to connect on a personal level um, a lot of times. So Going to that show, talking to the speakers and learning and really seeing what people on a larger scale than you do. Um, and then over the last you know handful of years, I've attended the majority of those workshops and that kind of thing, um, those types of educational avenues, which has been, if you've never been to a conference, I don't know what you're doing, save the money, whatever, um, go. It is if nothing else, for a networking ability to connect with other people around the country to do just those things, to learn and to talk. And if something goes wrong, you have somebody to that's probably been through it before or that can learn from that. So that's really – going to those has been um, probably one of the most influential things I've done. I do want to focus on something that you said a few minutes ago about value, and there was a, a part of your journey, and this is a thread that I'm noticing when I talk to uh, other DJs and when I reflect back on my own experience, what I've found is that there's there, there tends to be a pivotal moment in the career of a professional DJ that's taken this seriously and wants to make a business out of it, and it goes something like this. You're charging somewhere under $1,000, and then you realize, wait a second, I might be doing it wrong. So I don't know what that looks like for you, but what was it like when you realized that the service that you were providing was valuable and kind of talk me through your own personal realization of this has to, I have to be charging more for what I am providing. Talk to me about that. So we started off and we charged like 685. We'd even dip down on like off peak days and things for like 585. Why? Because that's what we used to charge back years before, and that's what I knew. 
So the thing I've come to learn over time is the only person who's worried about that number is us. Every time we've increased pricing, every time we have decided to come up with a new package or to, like a few years ago, we came up with, uh, you know, it's certainly inspired by the SCE guys. They do an awesome thing. Is this furniture. We work with a lot of planners. They have so much focus on the look of everything. And let's face it, a lot of DJs walk in with like this black ugly box and sit it on a six foot skirted table and that's the DJ booth. But yet these these people spent $40,000 on pretty flowers, tablecloths, linens, you name it. Um, so for us, that was, let's, let's do this. So that was certainly reaching into a different higher price point. Um, how you realize when it's time or when you're providing enough value to be able to raise the rate and still command is pretty straightforward. What's the feedback you're hearing from clients, from couples, and what's the feedback you're hearing from other vendors? Well, uh, not to speak ill, but I hear a lot of crazy stories that happen in my market from other DJs, and we wish we had had you. Okay? If that's happening, that means you are highly valued. If people, if you're turning away, you know, if you're turning away dates, so like you're fully booked, whether you're a single op or a multi-op, and, and your capacity is full and you're turning away, raise your rates. That's It's time. Um, people are telling you you're in demand. Um, part of it for me and let's, I mean, I still, this is still a constant thing of, um, of where we can go. Not because we're greedy, because I genuinely want to provide an awesome living for myself to provide for my family, for my team to provide for theirs. So, um, and I focus on, money a lot with our team but truth of the matter is we all have to be able to feed ourselves and provide for our future so that's why can we you know there's a lot of there's a lot of small businesses in the wedding industry as a whole who don't charge what they're worth they're getting paid if they did the math probably pretty pretty damn close to minimum wage and it's just not working the average life of a wedding vendor is seven years seven years. So, and that's an average. So that means there's some far less and then there's some who are, are, are more given the fact that there's a lot fewer in the higher range than the lower. I guarantee it just because this is a tough business as DJs. I love college football. I love family time. So being on the, being on, being gone every weekend, that's the tough part, right? So what is that worth to you? What is that time away from your family worth? For everybody, that's probably a different answer. Um, but if people want you and you're booking, keep going. In the grand scheme of things, you know, a DJ to bump their price is two hundred dollars. If you're charging six eighty five to go to eight eighty five, it's like a twenty five percent ish bump. Okay. $200 in the grand scheme of a wedding budget is pennies. And if they want a quality entertainment, because let's face it, they're hiring a stranger to come speak in front of their closest family and friends. What is $200? Nothing, if, as long as you're providing the peace of mind. Um, and certainly, I encourage everybody to charge more than $885. But just an example of that number... That whole, this assumes you are providing value and doing a great job. Do not get me wrong. But the other part of that is as long as people are telling you that and the feedback and the business supports that thought, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going because it's, it's there. I think, the, like I said, the biggest challenge is up here uh, in our heads and not in our clients. People want to buy something, you know, there are many different price points of cars. You can buy a brand new car for twenty thousand or a hundred thousand. The only thing that's different is the value that the car provides. It's still going to get you point A to point B, but what all does it entail? And then how does um, how, how is it perceived by the public? 
I think, was it Payless Shoes a couple years ago? Took their $10 sneakers and $10 shoes or whatever. Uh, I think it was in New York City. They did this boutique setup, store setup thing. Put the same shoes, no different, all the same shoes. And we're charging $400 a pair and getting it. And people were like, this quality is fantastic and blah, blah, blah. No, these are $10 sneakers because you wrapped it a certain way. So there are many reasons as to why people buy um, things. But that's slightly off topic, but certainly, um, and goes to my marketing love because that's what I love to do. Um, But so I really think, yeah, I mean, just if you're charging, the, the word value is very important. If you're bringing the goods, get paid for it. Yeah, and I think the big takeaway here is that so many of us have to learn this. This isn't something that on day one from having a love for music and doing events is something that you have all figured out. This is kind of a lifelong process. So this is why those networking events are important. This is why reading books and and watching how uh, different trends go because value and really internalizing that and having the confidence to charge um, substantial rates, it's a balance of being able to deliver the goods, but then also having that clarity of of what you're providing and knowing that you can show up and deliver the true value of that and not just you know a summation of all the equipment that you offer. Well, we're coming uh, kind of close in terms of uh, how much time we have, and I have one more question that I want to ask you that's uh, kind of interesting. I'm very curious to see how you would answer this, and it's what are some of your big DJ pet peeves? With clients or with DJs? Well, for somebody who's um, who's coming into the industry and maybe they're they're a beginner and they're making some mistakes either in their performance or in the way that they're kind of uh, presenting themselves, uh, and you look at another DJ doing their thing and they're trying to make it happen, but you're just kind of cringing, going, "Oh man, that's a big pet peeve. I I hate that." Um, so I, I would say it could be both. It could be in the way that they're treating a client, or it could be in the way uh, that they perform. Um, realizing it's not about you. You are one cog in the machine. Um, certainly, you know, I, I jokingly say with our clients, you know, we're the quarterback. There's a lot of moving parts, and we kind of started into motion. But certainly, if we're doing our job well and communicating with the – so this will age me, but when I got into this, photographers used film. Yeah, I know, back, back in the day. You had to communicate with them. They weren't always ready. Now it's a lot easier, but so that's kind of ingrained in being part of the team, communicating. If they're having a good time, one, if they're having a good time, you know, one, our DJ, our our job is easier. And two, they're a lot more likely to refer us. And three, which is the ultimate, is our couple gets the best work, you know, People who I, I, I've heard, you know, I've heard stories. I'm sure we all hear these about DJs who walk in demanding a meal right off the bat before they get started. That no, like they're not paying us to be there. Do, do I love to eat good food? Heck yeah, I love to eat good food. But that's not what we're there for. Um, mediocrity drives me crazy. And yes, I know there's different talent levels. There are people who start brand new. Just because you're new doesn't mean you're mediocre means you're fresh, which being fresh sometimes is a good thing because you're looking at it with a fresh lens. Um, I wish I'd have found DJ education a lot sooner. As far as workshops, um, which are, there's 10 different ones easy, like easily um, that happen on an annual basis to help performance. um, And just the, you know, the willingness to collaborate is another one. And I think a lot of DJs, I've been in these shoes as well. I don't want to share whatever. There are no secrets. This is hustle. This is busting your ass to really build a true business and living out of it. Um, it's not for the weak. There, there's a lot of jobs that pay uh, pretty good that you would work a lot less on. So um, it's not for everybody, at least going full time. And I know there's a lot of guys who have that desire to go full time. And by no means am I squashing that dream because it's a great thing to be doing. I've done this full time for years now. So um, 
but realizing if it's for you or if it's not, because it's not for everybody. Um, running your own business is not. So not so much a pet peeve, but kind of, uh, I guess, a, a caveat, a little warning ahead of time. Um, but I don't, I don't know. As far as other pet peeves, um, ah, got one. Dressing the part. You know, we should look like the guests look. We shouldn't stand out. We shouldn't take attention away. Um, that's the same thing for our setup. That's why we have nice furniture setups. And even if there are more, you know, standard packages, everything is nice and neat and clean because we should fit the, the uh, atmosphere that we're in. Same thing with our clothing and facial hair and whatever. So, uh, so yeah, that's all of that really rolls into my first point of it's not about us. We're there. Yeah. I mean, we love what we do, but I don't know about you, but a lot of the music I play at weddings, I don't necessarily listen to on the regular because it's my favorite. Um, I play what they want us to, to do. And, um, and that's that. Um, I guess I have another pet peeve. Um, another pet peeve would be bashing on the planner. I hear so many DJs and see online all the time. And yes, I'm sure there's some bad apples. Just like there's some crappy DJs, I'm sure there's some crappy wedding planners. Cool. But I make a lot of money from wedding planners. They save me a lot of time and marketing dollars by bringing us clients directly through our networking with them. So they also make my job easier. So yes, I again, I realize that we... We know certain parts of the wedding better than everybody else. And we all have our own roles, just no matter what, whatever that is. But wanting to work with the other people and not whining and complaining about what they do is, to me, pretty, pretty important and will actually yield some great financial results and some booked business um, based on building relationships with those folks. So they're allies, they're not enemies. Absolutely. Yeah, I've definitely found that to be true for me as well. And and really, in those first couple years, it was a relationship with key vendors that allowed me to stay in the business and really grow it. And if you don't have that attitude of, as you said before, collaboration, and just kind of a just a, a humility and realizing, hey, look, you're important, but you're just one cog in the machine. That is so important if you really want to stay in this industry. And if you don't have some of those foundational building blocks, you're going to burn out. The word's going to get out about how you behave and, and what your attitude is like. And your relationship with the other vendors is just so important to longevity. So I definitely uh, just completely resonate with what you're saying. It's it's fantastic advice. Any final words or for the person who's just starting off, they're on the, the front end of their journey. Any other advice that you'd like to give them in closing? Talked about this a, a little while ago, but find a business mentor, somebody that's maybe done this for five years. They They will have learn from mistakes and if you can learn from somebody else's mistakes before you cross those same you're going to save a lot of money and a lot of heartache so there's now there's educational resources out there you know that that help um my friend joe bunn dj's vault that's a perfect example of a lot of educational information that can kind of jump start you because he's you know we've all wasted money and done things that we wish we hadn't um so find somebody else to, to learn from. Um, going it alone, having been there, is a rough ride sometimes. Being, um, it is, we own a small business, just like a lot of other small business owners. But our, our, and so I'm assuming those are the same way. But what I know here is it can be lonely sometimes. You're making these decisions in a vacuum. It's just you. So having somebody else that maybe has been there before you is, excellent. Um, just buying smart, buy quality to start with. You know, yes, you might have to keep pushing money in that piggy bank a little longer, but that quality equipment is going to last much longer than um, the cheap. I mean, there's a reason some equipment costs three times the same thing 
in a cheaper model because it's going to last. And when it's going to last, ultimately, you're going to actually make more money off of it. So make wise decisions off the bat. Um, although I know it's hard when there's not a lot of money in the account. I've been there. Um, make wise decisions there and um, and just don't overextend yourself. And like I said, I don't love building a business on a lot of debt. And um, it's actually the Chick-fil-A model, if you weren't aware. So they've done pretty darn good. I think it's pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty legit. They pay off a franchise, then they open another one. They pay one off, and then they buy another one. So similar to this, um, that works really well. And um, because one bad thing could really shut your business down. Um, so be insured, run it legit from the get go. All of that kind of stuff is because a lot of us start out, this starts out as a hobby and then turns into a business. Um, identify that early so that you can be, you know, on, on the right path as soon as you can. Um, but that's really it. That's seek out, seek out other people. That's really learning from others in the business is, is where it's at. That's why a podcast like this is super helpful. You can learn while working out or while driving your car. Um, so this is great. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be on the episode today. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Josh. All of the links to check out Justin's stuff will be posted in the description of this podcast. You can also visit UptownEntertainmentDJ.com for more information. I want to thank you so much for being a listener of Wedding DJ School. You can find us over at WeddingDJSchool.com. Also, you can text Wedding DJ to 44222. We will ask for your email address, and in return, we will send you all of the podcast action guides for Season 1 of Wedding DJ School. So you can do that for free just by texting Wedding DJ to 44222. Lots of actionable advice that you can put to use right away, all for free. Well, we're going to continue talking with with leaders in the wedding entertainment industry. We will be back next week with a new episode.